Thank you for joining the Fire Suppression Systems Association webinar on the SHAPE program. Your phone lines have been muted. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box on the bottom right-hand side of your webinar control box, and we will take them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will, will be available to download along with the slides after the presentation is over. With us today, we have our webinar chair, Todd Stevens with Canastraro, and our presenters, Dave Hoffman with Firetrace International and Michelle Thompson with BFPE International. I'll now turn the mic over to Todd to introduce our presenters. Thank you, Becca. Hello, and welcome to the FSSA webinar series. As mentioned, my name is Todd Stevens. I am the chair of the webinar committee, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. Today's presentation is the SHAPE program, which is a special hazard awareness, promotion, and education seminar. Our presenters are Dave Hoffman from Firetrace International. David is the National Sales Manager of Engineered Fire Suppression Systems at Firetrace International. He's been in the suppression industry his entire life and has held positions on new, a number of FSSA committees as a previous FSSA board member and currently serves as the FSSA Public Policy Committee Chair. Dave is also currently sits on the NFPA 2001 Committee. Our co-presenter is Michelle Thompson from BFPE International. She is employed there, which is headquartered in Hanover, Maryland. Ms. Thompson presently works as the Corporate Director of Marketing and was a, previously a General Manager of the Clayton uh, NC branch, as well as the Dover, Delaware branch. She has an MBA from Drexel University and a BS degree in chemistry from Indiana University. Before we begin, I wanted to make one quick announcement. I wanted to be the first to announce to all of our members to save the date. Our annual forum is set for March 1st through the 5th of 2019 at the Hammock Beach, Beach Resort, Palm Coast, Florida. If you're not an FSSA member, this is not an event you will want to miss, so please visit FSSA.net for more information both on the forum and FSSA membership. Without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to our presenter, Dave Hoffman. Dave? Thank you, Todd and Becca. Um, I want to uh, make sure that we understand the purpose of this today. Uh, this presentation is a tool for the uh, FSSA members for their use when making presentations to their customers or trade groups or any opportunities uh, that may present itself. Uh, for those of you who are not members of the FSSA, uh, we hope you find this to be uh, an informative session. And uh, to get started, I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your day uh, to be here. Um, I'm in beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona, so good morning. And to everyone else, good afternoon. Um, Firetrace and BFP have both been members of the FSSA uh, since its inception, well over 30 years. Uh, and we're proud to be associated with some of the top manufacturers and installers in the fire suppression industry. You'll find this uh, very informative and hopefully you'll come away with some useful information. So we'll get started. While just about everything in the world of data processing changes on a daily basis, there's one thing that remains constant throughout, and that is the threat of fire. The fact is, even the smallest fire, such as on this printed circuit board, can cause an unimaginable amount of damage and can do so in a very short period of time. To help understand the full impact of a fire and the associated risks involved, the Fire Suppression Systems Association has created a program called SHAPE. That's an acronym for Special Hazards Awareness, Promotion, and Education. Now, while the term special hazards can be applied to a number of applications requiring sophisticated fire protection solutions, this program will focus on some of the most common areas within a facility that can benefit from the installation of a clean agent fire suppression system as the primary means of fire protection. Some examples of such areas would include data centers, 
co-location server farms and telecommunications facilities, as well as museums, archive rooms, and other areas that contain high value electronics and or specialized medical operations. It's in these critical areas where conditions such as high airflow, obstructions, unattended operations can lead to very difficult challenges in detecting and suppressing a fire. In many cases, the equipment in these areas is anything but off the shelf. Often custom built for a particular process and any downtime can represent a loss in revenue and output that will in almost every case far exceed the cost of simply replacing the damaged equipment. It's for this reason that the professional members of the Fire Suppression Systems Association, comprised of manufacturers and installers, provide the high level of expertise in the design and installation and maintenance of the fire suppression system is the best fit in demanding applications. both in data processing and in telecommunications, and also in fire suppression. One of the more famous events that shows the real impact of downtown is the Hinsdale Fire in Chicago, which occurred on May 8, 1988. Now, you probably don't remember that specific day in 1988, but it was a Sunday, and it just so happened to have been Mother's Day. Even today, Mother's Day is one of the highest call volume days of the entire year. This excerpt from the Chicago Tribune a year later sums up what happened. A single broken electrical power line that came in contact with a single telecommunications line caused overheating that led to what experts believe was the greatest telecommunications disaster ever. The May 9th, May 8th, 1988 fire at Illinois Bell's Hinsdale switching station. And while this connection of the two lines was the beginning of a series of mistakes and problems that Mother's Day, that resulted in disruptive telephone service for 500,000 Chicago area telephone users. In addition to the 500,000 immediate customer disruptions, 42,000 customers were without their phone service for an entire month. So why is this important in our discussion today about today's data and telecommunications applications? The answer is that in 1988, it took a fire several hours to consume an entire floor of the switching station. And it took out Dave, whole Dave can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. David, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the phone's going in and out a little bit, technical difficulties. Um, I'm going to switch over and, and see if Michelle can pick up where you're at and see if we can get a a better uh, handle on your phone line. So Michelle, could you jump in here and uh, and and keep going with this? I sure can. Um, so, go ahead, Dave. Is that better? I'm taking out my headset. No, it's not. <laughs> go ahead, Michelle. Um, okay. So it only took out 500,000 customer service. That's right, only a half a million lines. With today's equipment, a fire of only several minutes would cause significant damage and business interrupt disruption. The Ford Fire. We read headlines today about business disruption caused by fires. We see these all the time. There was the Delta Fire. This was a significant disruption and downtime could be prevented in some cases through the use of clean agent fire suppression systems. There was the Sprint Fire. In today's fast-paced world of instant news through the internet, mobile devices, and chat accounts, businesses cannot afford downtime and business interruption, as well as the bad press from headlines. Today's clean agent fire suppression systems, coupled with sophisticated smoke detection systems, have kept up with the advances in technology and can provide a level of protection that can address a fire situation faster and in its earliest stage. A lot has changed since 1988. For one, Halon 1301 was the fire suppression agent of choice for the type of environment such as the Hinsdale facility, although that particular switching station did not have a Halon system at the time of the fire. Had the Hinsdale facility been equipped with a Halon system, we probably would not be talking about it today. The reason for Halon systems, in addition to fire sprinkler systems, is that 
is that its ability to quickly discharge the fire suppression agent upon smoke detection rather than waiting for an accumulation of heat, as is the case with the fire sprinkler operation. Also, halon is discharged as a gas that is non-conductive, leaves no residue, and best of all, it is safe for occupied spaces. It is non-toxic and extinguishes fire at a molecular level rather than by oxygen displacement. If that sounds too good to be true, it was. In 1993, all production of new halon was banned by the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the Montreal Protocol due to its high ozone depletion potential, or ODP. At about the same time, the EPA created the SNAP list. SNAP stands for Significant New Alternatives Policy and is still in use today. The EPA website defines SNAP as EPA's program to evaluate and regulate substitutes for the ozone depleting chemicals that are being phased out under the stratospheric ozone protection provisions of the Clean Air Act. Any fire suppression agent created to replace halon has to receive approval from the EPA SNAP list prior to being commercialized. That is, this is the current most up-to-date SNAP list for the total flooding halon 1301 replacements and serves as only an example. The full list can be found on the EPA's website. One of the requirements is that replacement agents must have an ODP of essentially zero. Several desirable qualities of halon have to be matched as well. The gaseous agents have to be non-conductive, leave no residue, and safe for use in occupied spaces. Several acceptable halon alternatives have been developed by FSSA manufacturer members. The choice of today's modern clean suppression agents are divided into, a two, into two major categories, halocarbon clean agents, inert gas clean agents. We will talk about each of these and their distinct characteristics. It is important to note that regardless of the way each agent is applied and how it goes about suppressing a fire, each is listed as approved on the EPA SNAP list. Even more important, all of these halon substitutes are approved for use in occupied spaces. That is not to suggest that you remain in a protected space during or after a discharge, especially considering there's probably a fire somewhere. It simply means that if someone is trapped or can't get out of the room before the agent discharges, the suppression agent will not harm the occupant. The first group that we'll cover is the halocarbon fire suppression agents. These are the agents closest in design and performance to halon. They are primarily HFCs and fluoroketones that extinguish fire at the molecular level, not by displacing oxygen. They function primarily by removing heat, but they also contribute to the interruption of the chain reaction that is combustion. These agents are stored as liquids and are rapidly converted to a gaseous state upon discharge. The next group is the inert gases. Unlike the halocarbon agents, the inert gases suppress fire by means of oxygen displacement. They remain safe for use in occupied spaces due to the design of the systems. The inert gas discharged into a protected space reduces the oxygen level only to that which will be prevent combustion, but not to an unsafe level for the occupants. As important as the extinguishing agent may be to successfully suppressing a fire, another key element is in the detection and controls that are the brains of the system. In the same way that technology has advanced in the agents used to suppress the fire, it has also advanced in detecting smoke in the earliest stages of a fire event and then controlling the operation of the fire system. In many cases, smoke is detected well before it is visible to occupants, buying valuable time to limit equipment damage. Perhaps the biggest advances have been made in smoke detector sensitivity. One might think that with increased sensitivity would come an increased likelihood of false alarms. Actually, it is the opposite. Due to the sophistication of today's smoke detectors, the occurrence of false alarms has been greatly reduced by the device's ability to discern between products of combustion and other particulates. In addition to faster detection and reduced false alarms, a smoke detector found in a typical system today has programmability features that allow automatic adjustment of the sensitivity based on the time of day or the day of the week. 
The amount of data available in systems equipped with these detectors is quite extensive. A history can be maintained at the control panel that records every event with a timestamp. Such systems log all information, even down to the amount of smoke that was present at a given location and for how long. The control panels, which in the past were a series of relays that simply provided on-off functions, have been replaced by microprocessors, often as sophisticated as the equipment they are designed to protect. In summary, today's clean agent fire suppression systems parallel the advancements in the very technology found in areas which they project. In communications, in de data processing and data storage, in medical equipment, and in so many other fields that rely on 7x24 operations. With today's super fast processing speeds and increased storage cap capacities comes an equal increase in the risk associated with any downtime. Downtime costs money, it impacts customer confidence, it interrupts productivity, and in the event of a fire, it can cost lives and property. Do you want me to keep on going on the next section? Or Dave, are you yeah, on? And then, yeah, go ahead, Michelle, and Dave will try to okay. jump in on the third session. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm back Thank on. Uh, let me know if you can hear me properly, and then uh, we can continue in this, uh, in when you're actually giving this presentation, this would be a break in the action where you could field questions from your audience and then we would continue on from here. So, Michelle, go ahead and take it away on section two and I'll be back for section three. Okay, wonderful. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, so, as a quick review, in the first segment, we talked a lot about specific hazards, advancements in technology, and the current state of clean agent fire suppression that has kept pace with the equipment it is designed to protect. In this next segment, we're going to go back to the basics and talk about the F in FSSA. Of course, that stands for fire. It could also stand for friend or foe. Although there is no exact time in history that has been definitively identified, but somewhere between 1 and 1 1.8 million years ago, give or take a few weeks, that's when humans discovered the power of fire. According to the Smithsonian, it is widely accepted that fire is responsible for the advancement of humans. As an, as an example, cooked meat provides 35% more energy than raw meat, and this is believed to have contributed to the growth of the human brain. So we were credited with being able to control and manipulate fire over a million years ago, but somehow we still have seem to have trouble with the control part. It's actually a little known fact, but language was also developing at the same time, and some of the first words may have been, uh-oh, the first time a fire got out of control. The stats on the screen confirm the difficulty of controlling the awesome power of fire. A million or so years later, and fire still kills about 3,500 people each year in the U.S. alone. There are also 6,500 non-residential fires started by electrical malfunctions, which account for astronomical property losses. So why is this? We've managed to harness the power of fire for so much good, but it still finds a way to do so much harm. It's a pretty safe assumption that sometime shortly after the discovery of fire, there became a need to also put out a fire. A rainstorm probably introduced primitive man to the first extinguishing agent. Throughout the ages, water has been the most common element to extinguish a fire. Although we are talking about clean agents today and water is not a clean agent, it is still important to cover here. With few exceptions, every public building is protected by a fire sprinkler system and for very good reason. Fire sprinkler systems are an integral part of overall building safety. It is important to understand their purpose. The sprinkler heads that you see above you in every building are heat activated. Contrary to Hollywood's many inaccuracies, they do not all activate at once in normal applications. A, sprinkler, a single sprinkler head will fuse or open when enough heat is created beneath it. That particular sprinkler head will then continue to discharge water at a rate of roughly 20 gallons per minute until someone shuts off the water supply. This is simply not acceptable in data centers or other high value applications where the water damage from a fire event could be far greater than the fire and smoke damage. Contrary to popular belief, water from a sprinkler discharge does not come from Fiji. The water in the sprinkler system has been contained in the sprinkler pipe and depending on the sprinkler system maintenance regimen can be extremely dirty and discolored. It's also important to understand the role of a sprinkler system. 
That role is simply to save the building, and for that, they do a great job. In the area of high-value assets, data centers, museums, and other applications, however, the thought of water and pipes overhead is sim something of a concern to the building owners. To address this, the industry developed a way to keep the pipes overhead filled with air but still maintain the same level of protection. This is called a pre-action sprinkler system. It is designed to be activated by a combination of smoke and heat. To do this, a section of the sprinkler piping is isolated and controlled by its own separate valve. In a normal state, the piping above the critical area is pressurized with air to avoid any possibility of a water leak. When the system smoke detectors activate, the control valve opens and the pipe fills with water. Now you have a standard sprinkler system, ready to be activated when the heat of a fire fuses or opens a sprinkler head. It is important to understand that there is no increase or decrease in the level of protection with a pre-action sprinkler system. A pre-action system simply provides assurance that there is no water in the pipes above that could possibly leak, causing damage to the high-value assets below. So back to the topic of fire. What is it exactly? The six elements of the life cycle of fire are described by Dawson Powell in The Mechanics of Fire. These elements are input heat, fuel, oxygen, proportioning, mixing, and, and ignition continuity. All of these elements are essential for both the initiation and continuation of the diffusion flame combustion process. The first three elements, input heat, fuel, and oxygen, are represented by the fire triangle. A more accurate re representation, however, is the fire tetrahedron. Heat, fuel, and oxygen may be necessary to allow combustion, but without the chemical chain reaction, there will be no fire. That leads us to the S in FSSA, suppression. Until the invention of various types of halon to suppress a fire, you had to remove one of the three elements of the fire triangle. It was halon, and to a degree, some of today's chemical clean agents that began to address the chain reaction part of the fire tetrahedron. This led to safer and more efficient fire suppression systems and clean fire suppression agents that did not add to the damage already done by the fire. So this is the end of segment two, and normally we would take a break for questions, but now we're gonna move on to the next segment where we'll discuss the specifics of clean agent fire protection. Okay, and I'm back. Hopefully this sounds much better than before. Uh, so to briefly review segment two, we discussed that the role of the sprinkler system is simply to save the building, and for that they do a great job. In the area of high value assets, data centers, museums, and other applications, however, the thought of water in pipes overhead is something of a concern to the building owners. A typical data center or computer room from the 1970s was often many thousands of square feet in size. Data storage was on magnetic tape reels and data input was done with punch cards. While technology reduced the size and footprint for many of today's sophisticated electronics, the capacity and speed of data processing and other high-tech equipment has increased. Fire has not been subjected to any technology ed technological advancements, however. In fact, the reduced size and increased density of this equipment makes early detection and suppression of a fire more important today than ever before. Let's take a look at the fire suppression options that are available today. We can divide these into three basic categories. Water, which we've already covered, halocarbon clean agents, and inert gases. If we go to the specifics of each agent, it's important to know that there are several factors common to each one in this group. They're all considered clean agents, meaning there's no residue and no cleanup after a discharge. They are gases with the ability to suppress a fire from a 3D perspective. Also, they are non-conductive, which means they're safe for use to protect energized electrical equipment. And more important, they may be used at concentrations which are safe for people and used in occupied spaces. The first category is the halocarbon clean agents. This group of suppression agents is the most comparable to halon in several ways. They have similar characteristics to halon in the way they are stored and delivered and the applications in which they are used. The prim they primarily extinguish fire by absorbing the heat from the flame. With the big push toward green, inert gases have become a good choice as well 
as they are the most green of all the clean agents. They are naturally occurring elements in our atmosphere. Inert gases are defined as using one or more of the gases nitrogen, argon, and CO2. The inert gases and blends extinguish a fire by reducing the oxygen concentration to a level that won't allow combustion, but not so low as to be safe for occupants. As discussed in the opening session, the EPA SNAP approved halocarbon inert gas clean agents have zero ozone depletion potential or a zero ODP. These new agents are not without their own environmental issues, however, as the concern for global warming potential has become more of a factor. The global warming potential, or GWP, of a given gas is determined primarily by its ability to trap heat and how the gas will remain in the atmosphere. The GWP compares how much heat a given mass of gas will trap in a given time as compared to the same mass of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is given a GWP value of 1. So an agent with a GWP of 100 has the same warming effect for each pound as that of 100 pounds of CO2. Now, one important factor that's often overlooked is the environmental effects caused by a large fire. Today's clean agent fire suppression systems utilize a very sophisticated smoke detection and act very quickly to suppress a fire at the earliest stage. It's widely understood in our industry that the environmental impact of the extinguishing agent is considerably less than that of an uncontrolled fire or of a fire that takes long to, longer to be extinguished by a water system which needs to wait for the heat to reach a certain level. The following slide shows some of the most commonly used chemical clean agents. The first is FK5-1-12, which is a 3M product known as Novec 1230, and is it's a liquid at room temperature and rapidly converts to a gas upon discharge. HFC-227EA is produced by the Chemours Company, and it goes by the trade name FM200. This agent is liquefied under storage pressure, and it also rapidly converts to a gas as it's ditch discharged. The Waysmos Fine Chemical Company manufactures a wide variety of generic agents that are used in recharge and some new applications as well. Moving on to the inert gases, IG541, or inergen, is an inert gas comprised of 50% nitrogen, 42% argon and 8% CO2, components that are naturally present in the atmosphere. Therefore, its greenhouse effect is nil and its ozone depletion potential is zero. It's chemically inert, non-conductive, colorless, odorless, and flavorless. IG541, or inergen, is non-corrosive and may, may be used at normal temperatures with such materials as nickel, steel, stainless steel, copper, brass, bronze, and plastics. Energen suppression systems are based on the principle of reducing the oxygen concentration inside the protected hazard. Each system is designed to decrease oxygen to a specific level. When discharged, energen is quickly and uniformly distributed within the enclosure, achieving design concentrations in 60 seconds for fast growth fire hazards and 120 seconds for slower growing fire hazards. IG55, also known as argonite, is a simple blend of 50% argon and 50% nitrogen, with a density similar to that of air. Both argon and nitrogen are clean, naturally occurring gases that are readily available throughout the world. The agent has no global warming potential or ozone depletion potential. Argonite requires no post-fire cleanup and will not decompose or produce any byproducts when exposed to flame from a fire situation. Nitrogen fire suppression systems utilize pure nitrogen, which is also a naturally occurring gas. In typical fire extinguishing concentrations, it's safe for use in occupied spaces and it poses no threat to the environment. Nitrogen operates as fire stuff using the oxygen content within a protected area to a point which will extinguish the fire without compromising the safety of the individuals present in the room. Nitrogen will not decompose or produce any byproducts when exposed to flame. Let's now do a quick review 
In the first segment, we talked a lot about specific hazards, advancements in technology, and the current state of clean agent fire suppression that has kept pace with the equipment it's designed to protect. First, there are positives and negatives in using water as your first line of defense. Data storage and data processing are faster and more compact than ever before. Even a small fire can have a devastating impact on business continuity. Rapid detection and suppression is key to minimizing this risk. Next, there is an approved and suitable clean agent solution for every application. Clean agent fire suppression systems are safe for people and they preserve and protect high value assets. Clean agent fire suppression systems downtime and lost productivity. The Fire Suppression Systems Association, who sponsored this presentation and is made up of the top agent manufacturers, system manufacturers, and installers in the fire suppression industry. The FSSA is represented on over 20 NFPA technical committees, and its publications are referenced in multiple NFPA standards. Additional training and educational resources are available through the FSSA on its website at www.fssa.net. If there are additional questions, I'll be available time permitting. The FSSA and all thank you for your attendance today. We encourage you to visit fssa.net. That would be the conclusion of the presentation. If you were giving it yourselves to your audience, you would have the time in between sections one and two and two and three to field questions, uh, break up the process a little bit, and then also at the end of the presentation, you can take any additional questions. Uh, it's also an opportunity for you to interact with your audience uh, and promote the company as the presenter. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Todd and Becca to close things out. Thank you very much. Dave, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate the presentation by you and Michelle. Um, Dave, I was kind of losing you a little bit on the end again, but if, if you could try, uh, could you explain to the group again um, uh, how they get this presentation uh, for the members of FSSA, how they get the presentation and, and how to go about um, maybe advertising to get it out to their local associations and or local engineers and owners and that sort of thing? Yes. Uh, an email to the FSSA will uh, provide you with access to Dropbox to download the presentation along with the script. Uh, as far as getting it out in front of your customers or uh, organizations, uh, normally salespeople are calling up wondering companies, architectural firms, uh, and oftentimes are called upon by so Dave, Dave, we're we're losing you again. Sorry, buddy. Um, so everyone listening, basically, as Dave mentioned, if you email us uh, the email address on the screen, the admin at fssa.net, uh, and explain to us that you're interested in getting a copy of this, we will be able to provide it to everyone uh, via Dropbox, as he mentioned, uh, with the script. Uh, this is a scripted presentation so that we can kind of follow along and everybody's on the same page about the message that we're trying to get out uh, with with this this shape program um, and we'd be happy I know Dave and Michelle both will be happy to work with any any uh, members out there specifically that want to understand a little bit better how to put the presentation out there or uh, how to get it out to their their local uh, groups and and again we really encourage all of our members this is a great presentation it's very informative. It has a lot of great information uh, about the suppression industry, as well as you know, explaining a little bit about the sprinkler water side as well. Um, and we encourage you to take this presentation, get out to your local engineers, uh, your AHJs, uh, owners, to just uh, spread the good word, if you will, about uh, fire suppression and the different clean agent systems and options that people have uh, in the industry. Um, so with that said, I don't know that we uh, oh, we do have a few questions coming in. So uh, Becca, you want to jump in here and we'll go through some of the questions and see if Michelle or Dave can help answer them. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, okay, so the first question that we have here, are the HFCs going to be phased out soon? And could you further explain the process? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, still a little broken up, Dave. <laughs> All right, let me try uh, opening the door here. There are no landmines in our meeting rooms here, so I'm stepping on a cell phone. Um, HFCs are not, they have a phase down schedule. They've been added to the Montreal Protocol. Uh, so there, there are some uh, concerns going forward, but at this particular moment, uh, fire suppression HFCs have been specifically excluded because of your benefits and, uh, and their level of protection. So at this point, uh, anyone desiring to use an HFC fire suppression clean agent um, should have all the confidence to be able to do that. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is, does breaking the chain reaction happen only with flaming fires or also with smoldering fires? Uh, next to the combustion process at the molecular level. So uh, if there is, uh, it, it would be more impactful on the flaming fires, but it also contributes to uh, interruption in smoldering fires as well. The uh, difference uh, being that the newer clean agents, the HFCs and the fluoroketones, the chain break is not a large part of the extinguishment process. It's kind of the opposite of halon, where halon primarily extinguished by the chain break, um, and there was some heat absorption, where the newer agents, they are primarily uh, heat absorption extinguishants rather than so the effectiveness is there regardless of a flaming fire or a uh, smoldering fire. Perfect. Um, okay, so if anyone has any additional questions, um, please make sure to type them in the question box at this time. We'll wait maybe another one more minute um, to see if any additional questions come through. And if not, then we'll wrap up the webinar. Hey, Becca, could I just ask, now that we seem to have Dave a little bit clearer, Dave, could you repeat the answer to the first question, if you wouldn't mind? I think it's an important question, and, and you answered it uh, uh, very good, and I just want to make sure everybody heard that that response. Sure. Um, HFCs have been added to the Montreal Protocol. <clears throat> there is a phase-down schedule. However, in every case thus far, HFCs used in fire suppression have been excluded. They are out on their own island, and because of the, the value and the safety that they provide, and one of the things that we mentioned during the presentation, that the fire itself, in many cases, is more environmentally damaging than the extinguishing agent, uh, HFCs should be able to be used with confidence from this point forward, unless something else changes in the next five to 10 years. But right now, you're safe to use the HFC agents. That comes through okay, Todd? That was great, thank you, David. Any other questions, Becca? Nope, no more questions. Um, as Dave stated before, this presentation will be available for FSSA members um, to download and actually present um, at sessions, we have a script provided and everything. Um, if you are interested, there will be a link on the FSSA website to request a copy of the presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for FSSA's webinar on the SHAPE program. Um, as a reminder, the presentation and slides for the webinar will be available on the FSSA website in the next week. Um, thank you again, and we look forward to having you join us on the next webinar.